Everyone, give it up for Chef Ria Dolly Barbosa. <laughs> hey, what's hey. going on? Let's start off. So I always like to go back to where you were born and where were you raised and the influence of family because I think that definitely heavily influences who you are today. Uh, so I was born in Iloilo City uh, back in the Philippines and grew up between Iloilo and uh, <laughs> And um, uh, Burro Duck Nuevo, actually, which is where my mom is from. So, um, yeah, spent some time, about five and a half, six years there before we moved to to California when I was six. Were you learning about cooking at that time or you still had no interest yet? Um, I mean, at a young age, not really. I was the oldest of three, so uh, it, it it was my job to help mom and dad in the kitchen. So, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of influence in, in that sense. So helping with, you know, the family parties and, you know, whatever Christmas, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, you know, it was, it was my job to help, uh, to help prep the things and eventually learned how to cook them too. Yeah. So yeah, coming here to America, um, you moved here to LA, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, so how, how was that? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I mean, oh, it was, it was a culture shock. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, um, I come from a big family back home, so um, coming here, it was, it was literally just the five of us: my parents, my two siblings. Uh, we had, uh, we had some family in LA, um, a couple cousins, but you know, you go from like that huge family structure to basically just us so you know it, it was a shock um my mom tells me i used to be a lot more outgoing when i was you know when i was a, a baby i guess but um I, I felt like i did retract a little bit before i you know kind of warmed up again there was a cookbook that you grabbed a hold of and that's kind of what started your interest in cooking <laughs> so the secret garden was my favorite book to read when i was in the fifth grade and i was so intrigued by these scones and tea service and we didn't have that you know so but when i saw that there was a secret garden book and i thought to myself oh i'm gonna save my allowance and cook and eat the things that they ate in the book <laughs> and, uh, and, and it happened and um i you know obviously having no baking experience uh failed miserably um uh, one of the things that I remember cooking, I wanted to really try scones because I was so intrigued by it in, in the cookbook. And, uh, you know, Filipino households, we don't use the oven. I think our oven was probably broken at, at, at <laughs> least at the least uh, uncalibrated, you know. So and my parents had. Do you remember those? Um, what do they call them? Uh, those turbo cookers, those turbo ovens. I don't yeah. know if you ever had one of those, but like, yeah, those like stovetop. Um, so I thought because it was called turbo oven cooker that that would have done the same thing. So, you know, I'm making this, I'm making the scone and really, uh, I, I found flour in the cupboard. Who knows how old that flour was? I didn't have, you know, we had the shed spread country crock, so not real butter either. So I overworked the dough. I put it in the turbo oven. I probably overcooked it. And when it was done, I took the turbo cooker lid off and I ended up burning the linoleum floor in the kitchen. And then, you know, so the scones were ready. I went to go bite thinking that it was going to be this like magical, delicious thing. <laughs> and it was not, it was not, it was dry. It was dense. It was, it was, it was inedible. Um, and, you know, I, I did this, I, I, w I was not supposed to be cooking because it was summer vacation and my parents were at work and I was supposed to be watching my little brother and sister. And to try to get rid of the evidence, I said, we have to eat all of this. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, they're praying, they want to eat it. Like I'm freaking out. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, and so, I, I don't even know. I think we tried to like bury it at the bottom of the trash can or something oh, eventually. But that was that, is, that was my first cookbook. This is what's funny is the way you describe food for me. If I was to bring up that story, I'd be like, oh, I, we just burned something or whatever. But the way you described everything and it's amazing how you just know the flavors, the texture of everything. Mm -hmm. And obviously that goes to your culinary background and going to culinary school, which we'll get into. I apologize to everyone. Everyone's probably gonna get really, really hungry because the pictures are amazing and just the way you're describing the food already. 
I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. So I was reading an article. Mm -hmm. You're talking about when you're nine or 10 years old, going to Torrance or Redondo Beach to uh, grab some crab. And then you remembering like how to make, learning to balance the, the fat and acid. Mm -hmm. And that already kind of like in your head, you're already thinking about, you know, uh, I guess, I don't know what you call it, but the foundation of cooking, I guess, or if that is what it, it would be called. I mean, I, I guess so. I, I, you know, at the time I, I didn't think like, oh, you know, I, I wasn't thinking balance. It was more so this is good, but maybe, I, you know, it could use a little bit more like lemon or whatever. Um, but yeah, those, those were, those were good days. Those were good weekends. You know, when we got to go, when dad would drive us down to Redondo Beach to quality seafood because you can just buy the crabs and the fish or whatever you wanted to get and then you found a table you sat down and we used to bring the big rice cooker pot with us now they don't let you like you have to buy it from them so they wised up because I feel like I feel like there are a lot of Filipino families there that would you know like they would roll up they would buy the crab, they would buy the fish, and then and then you know these like giant pots of like rice would just come out of that. <laughs> yeah, or probably any Asian family for that. Yeah, for pretty that matter, much. You know? Sure. Oh, that's too good. Awesome. And then high school comes around. Was mm -hmm. there anything in high school that pushed you even more? Like, I want to get into the culinary industry. Yeah. Um, I I mean, all this time I would watch. Uh, you know, ever since I was little, ever since maybe like eight or ten or so, like I just happened to find the cooking shows on TV and it, and, you know, it was always like the, like the stuff on PBS um, mm -hmm. and then like discovery channel. And then, you know, so I would watch these shows and, and every new show that would come on, like I was still watching them in high school. Um, and uh, I, you know, I was actually in marching band uh, at the time and uh, I ended up getting this scholarship uh, because I just happened to be the first um, drum major in, 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 in my high school's like history, uh, or first female, or sorry, drum captain, not drum major, first drum captain. And I ended up getting this $500 scholarship from the Marines for musical excellence. And oh, wow. after, uh, after the, uh, after the award ceremony, I, I went and found the, the person who awarded me, um, that scholarship. And I said, Hey, uh, thank you very much. I, I, actually want to pursue culinary arts and while i'm very uh thankful for this scholarship i completely understand if if you know that takes me out of the equation because i you know i want to pursue culinary culinary arts and instead of music and you know like thankfully they let me keep it you know they they said um they said uh what did they say they were like oh you know you know what you want and you know you seem very passionate about it so you know please like use it towards your, your school. So I got to keep that. But I, I think I had already known for quite some time that I wanted to pursue it. Um, I actually wanted to take home ec courses uh, in high school because we offered home ec. And, uh, you know, I, I think my AP English class was right down the hallway from it and I could always smell them making things, <sighs> and, you know, but at the time, uh, John Marshall High School was on three tracks. I was on C and uh, home ec was on a track and I tried to transfer, but you know, they wouldn't let me for whatever reason they wouldn't let me. So that didn't, that didn't stop me though, from pursuing, you know, culinary. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And so, so I found your, I think your drum major uh, picture right here, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but that's amazing that they gave you that and they still let you keep it. That's, that's really yeah. cool of them. So after high school, you went to culinary school? When I enrolled, it was the California School of Culinary Arts, based yeah. in Pasadena, right before I went into La Cordon, right behind Julia Child. Yeah. She came that day because they were dedicating one of the new labs to her. And because she was a wow. Pasadena resident, you know, they invited her to come. And I think they also named it the Julia Child Labs. So. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That was awesome. So was it, was it pretty cool? Yeah. Like when she came, was it inspiring to kind of hear her speak? And Yeah. It was it was so cool because the lab was right next the new lab was right next to um, our our lab I guess class lab there, and so she just popped in said hello like you know she was already pretty old by then so yeah. you know as, as much as you know we wanted to ask her questions and all that stuff and she was already speaking very quietly but you know it was it was very inspiring it was very cool to have her um, 
you know, surprise us with a visit in our classroom. I think we were all cooking something and, you know, she came in with her aid and we all literally just stopped what we were doing and just came and fawned over and someone said, hey, let's take a photo. And so that's, that's what, yeah, that's how we got that. That's awesome. So then, mm -hmm. so um, culinary school was what about, is it a year or two years? How long is it? Uh, it was, yeah, it was a year. And then I, I spent three months um, on an externship um, in Las Vegas. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, yeah, so let, let's get there. So, so after <laughs> that, yeah, you, you do an externship uh, in Vegas mm -hmm. and you were there for a while. So how was that experience? And and tell us the restaurants that you, uh, I guess, extern externed at. Uh, so I, the MGM Grand had an externship program and uh, it was, yeah, it was for the, the whole three months and they would rotate you through uh, different kitchens every two weeks. And so, you know, I got to, I got to experience working in the buffet in some of the prep kitchens and I came across, uh, I think it might've been my third or fourth kitchen that I was rotated through was, was the mansion. And uh, funny thing is I would, I would oftentimes go home really frustrated because uh, the chef was really particular. He was very like nitpicky and like detail oriented and it actually kind of drove me crazy. But mm. the second week, you know, I kind of started to see the reasons why and it was at the, or by the end of that second week, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, listen, this, this kitchen is irritating as hell, but there are reasons why he's doing this. And I, I want to continue learning. And because he has this, like the chef, Philippe Rispoli, he had this like incredibly high bar and, and incredibly high standards. And so, you know, I, I, I wanted to see what it was all about. I wanted to learn if, if he cared that much about, you know, a blemish on a mushroom for a salad that you would never see, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know, it intrigued me. And so, you know, it, it, it kind of helped, you know, pretty much form, form the way I kind of handle things today. So, you know, it turned out to be really great. And then did you hop to other restaurants within the, I guess the restaurant group? I asked to stay at the mansion and then I ended up staying there for about two years. And then after that, I left because, well, Philippe had gone on, Chef Philippe had gone on to another project and what, the chef that took over was going to be leaving and asked me if I wanted to follow him to this restaurant called Lutessa the Venetian. So I ended up following him there. I uh, spent about six months before he said, I'm leaving, but I don't know where I'm going to land, but I can hook you up with a friend of mine who is the chef at Michael Mina at the Bellagio. And so I jumped there for, for a little while. And then, um, and then the chef actually left there because he was going to open another, a new restaurant at the Win that was opening at the time. And uh, I wasn't going to follow him. I was actually going to follow another chef, but that kitchen fell through. And my first chef, Philippe Rispoli, he started calling me and leaving voicemails and asked me if I wanted to follow him to Daniel Blue Brasserie, where he was going to be the chef there, which is this crew that's in this photo right here. And so I ended up opening Daniel Blue Brasserie and stayed there for two years before I eventually left also. Within the French system, there's different hierarchies or levels. Can you explain that to the audience just for people who aren't familiar? Yeah. Um, so with a kitchen as big as, as the one that I was in, we were feeding like anywhere between three to 500 people on average every day. So you need a, a, a big uh, a big crew like this. And so all the, the cold apps and the hot apps guys, like they would be just like the regular cooks. And then when you move on to the hotline, uh, which is what- When you, when you uh, say apps, you mean appetizers, right? Sorry, yes, appetizers. Okay. So, you know, you had uh, the cold side of the appetizers, which is like crudo or raw bar. And, you know, all of those guys were cooks. And so whoever was the point person in charge of each, um, of each station is pretty much your chef de party. Um, uh, and that's who you, that's who pretty much like led the station. So every station, hot, cold, and then there was the meat, and then there was the fish. Um, you had your own little hierarchies in each of those stations. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
like my last year there, I was the chef to party of the meat station. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would have um, an entremet, which is the veg person that prepared the veg sides for the meat that I was, uh, was cooking. And then, uh, and then, yeah, and then you have your sous chefs and your executive chefs that are in charge and leading um, all of us in the kitchen. Got it. Awesome. It's a big, it's a big group. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that was a cool thing though, is like you were kind of slowly, obviously throughout those, that time there, you were able to kind of build yourself up and, and, and get your experience and, and definitely have people trust <laughs> you and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I awesome. uh, when I was promoted from hot apps to the meat station, um, not not as the chef to party right away. I I was actually the the veg guy for a while, but it was a Friday night and I was setting my 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 hot app station, and uh, my sous chef came up to me and said, "What are you doing here? You're supposed to be over there." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, did they not tell you you got promoted to to meat side?" Awesome. I'm like, "Oh." Oh my god! On a Friday night of all of all days, oh, so yeah, it was, wow. it was literal trial by fire, and I I think I did okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and so you know, for people who aren't familiar with the you know culinary industry, which I'm you know obviously not that, um, is, is it pretty cutthroat or is everyone friendly or is it like everyone's trying to get theirs like? Um. In the past, it was a lot more cutthroat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as as a woman coming up in the ranks, I literally had to run faster, cook better, and and you know just move more quickly uh, to kind of prove my worth in a way. But mm -hmm. thankfully, these days, uh, that old kind of kitchen culture is is slowly phasing out. Um, I think these days, and especially at Petit Peso, you know, I'm I'm more about uh, creating a a supportive um, a supportive kitchen where you know it's not so much like oh what is this what is that you know uh, that I've experienced is as much as it is more of like a you know building people up to what you expect them to be like giving them the right tools to do well and to cook well and to you know it, even if they don't stay in 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 at our place for you know, forever, then, you know, they take that with them. They take that compassion. They take that mm -hmm. empathy with them uh, to wherever they end up going next. So, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot more cutthroat. It was a lot more crazy back then. Um, mm -hmm. Even more so, I can't even imagine in like the 80s or 70s. But yeah, um, it is certainly a lot more understanding these days. That's good. And, and so so you kind of caught the tail end of that a little bit of that kind of cutthroatness or was it yeah. was it everyone already friendly in Vegas? I mean, people were pretty friendly. There were, you know, some people that were like, that already had egos and, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, you know, they thought that maybe they were better than everyone else. But I think for the most part, I lucked out. Um, I made some really cool friends and, you know, I still keep in touch with a lot of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, got lucky there. Yeah. Awesome. So then after that, um, so this is 2007 um, mm -hmm. and, and then 2008. Uh, you went to Salt Lake City in Park City, Utah. Is that correct? Um, yes. So I moved to uh, Salt Lake City for a relationship and ended up working there for three years. Okay. Um, and yeah, it was it was just a different it was just a different world in terms of like restaurants and mm. you know how they handle things. It was very much so. I got a taste of like I guess the old school like old boys club where. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it, it's just a different world. Like they, they, they valued my input, but not really, you know, I, I don't mm -hmm. know if it was a woman or a brown woman or, you know, like, I don't know, or like just even, you know, it could have just been because I'm not from Salt Lake City and, and mm -hmm. I had these different experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I tried working in restaurants out there and I didn't really like it. So I got into, um, specialty grocery i i stayed it's i stayed in the food in the food realm um okay. uh, as a, a produce manager at a specialty grocery store which is pretty cool okay interesting did, yeah did that kind of um i guess kind of teach you another part of an industry kind of like helped you with you know influencing Absolutely. you yeah yeah uh i i got to learn Okay, so you know when you work in restaurants and and you know you you prep and you cook uh, the menu that 
you know, the restaurant has. Uh, being a produce manager, I got to learn about and order and bring in different, uh, different vegetables, uh, you know, different fruits and vegetables that I normally wouldn't um, see in a regular kitchen, especially if, if that kitchen didn't really have a menu that, um, that, that changed very often. So mm. it, it gave me a chance to to learn about and and you know like I, I had a lot of downtime not working in a kitchen so often you know new items that I would bring in I would take home and test and because I ended up writing a newsletter for um, for the shop that I was working at too so like all these new vegetables and fruits that we were bringing in I would you know do like a brief description and offer like a like a recipe to try for people who may not have used that that, that kind of produce before. Mm, awesome. Mm -hmm. It's like a, like two years of R and D, if you could call yeah. it that. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's, like I said, like, I think everyone's journey is like, it, it's building up to a point. Right. And, and so, mm -hmm. so I guess you know, from that point, were you, were you like, okay, I'm going to learn this stuff. Cause I, I you know, I really want to open my own restaurant one day. I or really want to be like an executive chef or, or a um, chef de cuisine one day. Was that kind of like your, your plan all along, even at that point? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I always wanted to have my own place. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there there are a lot of lifers, you know, people who are completely fine with mm -hmm. staying in one spot and, you know, maybe not necessarily wanting to take over. But, you know, ever since I started, I always thought it would be awesome to eventually, you know, have have my own place to, you know, to to make the food that I enjoy making. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So then, so you, you said you did that for two years and then you moved to LA in 2010. H how did yes. that happen? Um, just really homesick. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it was hard to find ingredients. I think I ended up finding one, um, one Filipino market in Salt Lake City. Um, otherwise, it was really hard to find ingredients to, you know, to make foods, you know, that, that I was, you know, really homesick for. And, yeah. you know, I would visit every, you know, visit my family every so often. But, you know, just in, just trying to source ingredients for, you know, like I didn't know how to make sinigang from scratch at the time. And I didn't know where to get the packets. And before I found out that I could use, you know, straight up lime juice to make that really like sour component. But mm -hmm. um yeah, and, and also I think, you know, I, I felt a little bit of a dead end in Salt Lake City. And so, yeah. you know, moved back home to L.A. Um, and, you know, like amazing produce. There's amazing produce. The weather is better. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, there's more opportunity, you know, to to learn from my parents and like really learn, um, you know, their cooking and also, um, you know, learn more techniques and, you know, more things from the restaurants out here. And so your first job back here was lead line cook at Canale. Yeah. yeah. So Canale was actually in the neighborhood that I grew up in, in Atwater. It was just a couple blocks walk from the apartment that I first moved back into. And so I was looking for a job and my car wasn't working properly, like it wasn't reliable. And so I chose to try to find something close by that I could walk to. I came from like this super starched color, like super fine dining world in Las Vegas. And then, and then, you know, I come across Canale and it's very casual Mediterranean kind of like French bistro, like neighborhood vibes. And it was, it was the kind of kitchen that I had not been in yet. So, you know, it was, it was different and, you know, I, it was new and, you know, I wanted to learn it. So I, wow. Uh, went in, gave them my resume, and then the chef called me back and asked me if I had ever cooked brunch before, which I hadn't. And I was actually really terrified because, you know, brunch is a lot of eggs. Um, and surprisingly, eggs are really easy to mess up. Yeah. I'm still trying to make my eggs properly. <laughs> I mean, how much more for you guys to be like, it has to be perfect with the presentation. Yes. I know. Yeah. And, you know, like my, I, I grew up, like my parents taught me how to make eggs and it was, you know, fried in oil and it had like the crispy edges, which apparently isn't, isn't uh, how, you know, brunch pots usually make them. They usually make them in the French way with like no color and like really tender egg whites. And, 
you know, so I wasn't used to that. So I had to relearn, you know, you learn everything at that point. Yeah. That, that, yeah. So that was interesting. Cause yeah, I definitely read that in, in um, one of your interviews was yeah, definitely you having to kind of take what you learned and kind of like, I don't know if say dumb it down, but kind of like do a different way, a method. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the cool things that I really loved about working at Canelay was that Chef Karina had these things called friends cooks. Anybody could request to, to do a friends cook at Canelay. And I asked her if I could do it. I didn't work. I think I didn't work Tuesdays at the time, which is the, uh, the friends cooks nights. And, um, I, I asked her if I could do one and we talked about, um, the menu and I said, I kind of want to do a Filipino night. Um, you know, cook things that I, uh, you know, that I grew up eating. And I think for that first, cause I ended up doing two, um, you know, d different times. And I think that first night I did, I think it might've been like, um, like a pork adobo. I like saved this, uh, I cut the skin off, uh, before I braised the pork belly and then fried it. So you kind of had this like nice, um, top like this like nice lid of like crunchy chicharron on top with like the pork oh. belly like over some rice and then the broth at the bottom i think i did uh kinilau also to start as the appetizer and then i think for dessert i had an ube milkshake oh see that chat Did you guys hear that oh my god that amazing. <laughs> but yeah I, I think that's really awesome that um i'm sorry what's your uh uh karina was very mm -hmm. encouraging of you guys to kind of like, you know, um, push you guys pretty much. Yeah. And, and so, so yeah, so y your parents went there. Uh, what did they <laughs> think of your, uh, your uh, creation? <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's, it's different from what they made and, you know, from what we grew up eating. So, you know, Filipino parents, you know, they, even, even though they do like it, you know, the reaction is, is always like, hmm. You know, it's good. It's different, but it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, love, with love, of course. You know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, so then you, so you were at a, uh, can, Canelle, mm -hmm. Canelle, from yeah. uh, from tw twenty ten to twenty twelve. Mm -hmm. And after that, you were at um, Industrial as a lead line cook there as well from twenty twelve mm -hmm. to twenty twelve, like a couple mm -hmm. months. And then from that point, you ended up at Squirrel. So I, I met the owner, Jessica Coslow, through a mutual friend who I actually worked and met in Salt Lake City. So we worked together at the same specialty grocery store and he moved out to California first, to LA first. And so we had met prior and um, I was looking for another gig. I, you know, I wasn't the happiest at industrial. So um, this was when uh, Craigslist was still a viable place to search. <laughs> and so I looked at classifieds, you know, like uh, restaurant jobs in LA. And then I saw Craigslist ad for a chef at a little spot at the edge of Silver Lake called Squirrel. And before I answered, I hit up my friend Emmy, who introduced me to Jessica. And I said, hey, is this the person you introduced me to? Because I'm about to respond to their Craigslist ad. And so I answered it. I think I, I went in for an interview on a Tuesday and then... Um, and then we opened up like three or like literally three or four days later with the tiniest menu. Wow. And so for people who don't know, I just remember everyone was talking about squirrel. It was bananas there. It was literally like anytime you go there, it was a line out the door, mm -hmm. down the block mm -hmm. and be waiting like, I don't know, third, maybe probably even an hour just to get in there. And unfortunately, yeah. I never was able to make it there. You obviously helped create a lot of the dishes. Was there a seasonal portion too? Yeah, so we kept the hits, obviously, as you do. We had a pretty vast specials um, section of the menu. And so, you know, depending on what we found at the farmer's markets um, or, you know, whatever was in season or, you know, something that somebody gifted us, we would switch it up and come up with specials sometimes overnight. So we had a really quick rotating specials section. In the beginning, there was a lot of collaborative stuff, like the sorrel rice pesto bowl I helped put together. The owner, she had an idea of what she wanted to do. And then, so we kind of made that happen. And then over time, we would do things like, um, uh, I, I picked up a couple of things that I did at uh, while I was working at Michael Mina and kind of did a jam stuffed French toast and 
There was also the ricotta toast with the jam. And then eventually I started playing around a little bit more. Um, and I think I, I, I did uh, this kind of crazy version of kare kare where I would um, basically made a terrine out of, uh, I made an oxtail terrine, um, braised it till it was like super tender, fall off the bone, and then packed it into a terrine mold. And then I made this, it was kind of like, I it was inspired by dosas, which is uh, this like really crispy um, uh, fermented, um, fermented toast thing was um, uh, in Indian cooking. And so I wanted to do like a rice crepe and I just did like a really fresh, um, like bok choy slaw with bogo ong dressing. And so, you know, it was, it didn't look like it, but when you ate it all together, it kind of, it tasted like kare kare. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, so obviously, you know, the, I, I guess without saying it too much, but the clientele here was uh, not a lot of Filipinos. Uh, not really, right? no. Yeah. And so, so <laughs> how did they- Okay. Adventurous eaters. And so how did they take it? Um, they were very intrigued by it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it sold well, you know, these were the early days, um, before like Bon Appetit and food and wine and all of that stuff. So, you know, we had the time to do fun things like that. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, I don't know, like pe people loved it. People, you know, it was new to people. We got a lot of, you know, um, uh, people like poking their heads around, you know, the kitchen door and, and saying, thanks, that was incredible. I've never had anything like that before. Um, and like those wow. kinds of comments, which is really cool. So we were featured in Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, uh, the New York Times, the LA Times, LA Magazine, Eater LA, LA Weekly. So, you know, we were on all of the local, local food press, um, as well as like food publications. So, you know, we were recognized by um, Star Chefs, which is kind of more like an industry minded. Um, yeah, look at that line. That's insane. Uh, yeah, Star Chefs was more of like a like a industry minded um, um, publication, but it was two years or less than two years. And we were getting insane press. And, you know, it was at the time incredible, but also very overwhelming. So I'm curious though, for people who don't know, like LA, SF, New York, it's bananas here. It's like food Mecca, right? There's dozens and dozens of restaurants. Some come and go like within a year, a couple months, all that. Like, how do you, do you know, like what, what it was that put you on the map and was able for people to discover you? Oh man, we had a very small, but a very dedicated crew. And I think the frequency in which we came up with specials and kept adding hits to the regular menu like the crispy rice bowl that was amazing really focusing our time and effort on perfecting the menu items and the specials items consistently too was what kept bringing people back and you know if there's anything i've learned over the years it's executing consistently and perfectly every time and really having the mindset of everybody is VIP. And it's one thing that I tell new cooks that I work with is you never know who you're cooking for. Jonathan Gold came in for the first time and we all knew what he looked like already. But what if we didn't know? The new LA Times critic now is Bill Addison. I have no idea what he looks like. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's 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 having that mindset of, you know, executing perfectly and consistently every time. Um you know, because you really don't know who you're cooking for, like whether it's, you know, a new person who doesn't know anything about food, who wants to try something new, or like a seasoned diner, you know, like you want to hit that, you want to hit it right every time. And so, you know, having that mindset and having a whole crew um, of, of like minded uh, cooks, you know, I think that is ultimately what helped put us on the map. Yeah, well, that's incredible. Um, I think it was here, if I read it correctly. Also, I think John Hamm, what, was he, did he sample the food here at school? There's a yeah. story. Uh, yeah. He was, he was a oh, regular. If people don't know, John, John Hamm is uh, from Mad Men, as people know, mm -hmm. on AMC. But uh, go ahead. Yes. Um, you know, it was a very, I think, you know, we had an open kitchen. So it was the first time he came in and was like, oh my God, 
it's John Hamm, <laughs> you know, uh, everyone could see him. And so, you know, we tried to like be cool, but I think everyone's eyes were like, oh my God. Um, so he became a regular um, and it, you know, it was, it was, it was really cool. He actually, that one of the days that he came, I had a pork belly adobo on the special and I could hear him ordering it. And I was, you know, like super like nervous, like, oh my God, did you really order the adobo? Are you sure? And um, he ate it, you know, he sat at a table away from us so we couldn't see his reaction, but um, he came back inside the shop and poked his head into the kitchen doorway and said, thanks, that was really good. And I think, I think, you know, like we cut, like everybody just kind of stopped like, oh, crap, did he really just say that? And then there's like a twinkle in his eye, right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh my God, he liked the dope. That's awesome. That's amazing. Awesome. <laughs> so at Squirrel, you were there for two years. Mm -hmm. In 2014, you decided to leave. Why did you leave there? And where did you go afterwards? Oh man. Okay. So, um, you know, a little bit of drama happened. So it was during a time when chef owner was kind of the hot title that food media um, had given to, you know, a, a lot of other uh, chef owner um, um, started restaurants and, you know, they just, they just kind of like put her in, in the same bag essentially in terms of, of that descriptor. And um, the what was really happening in the background was that she wasn't really taking a hands-on approach in terms of um, creating specials. And you know, there there were there were some menu items that you know she did put on, but in terms of a kitchen presence, um, uh, she didn't really have that, um, and relied on us, her staff, uh, to to create and execute, you know, and, and maintain um, the food that everyone had come to know and love. And, you know, when I, I didn't mind it at first, you know, cause you know, what, you know, what was good for her was good for everybody. But I think seeing, you know, things like chef owner, chef owner, and like people asking her questions and, you know, also asking me simultaneously, like with, um, like with star chefs, they, um, they actually interviewed me briefly as well. Um, what started to happen was that people, you know, because she is the owner, um, people were just kind of, um, crediting all of these creations and all the things that we were doing in the kitchen to her. And, you know, I tried to have the conversation, um, quite a few times about how I felt about that. Um, even to the point where, where you know, like I, I, I tried saying, like, even if you don't um, mention my name, um, you know, say you have an incredible and dedicated staff, I just didn't find it fair that she was getting uh, the credit for something that she didn't do. And, you know, after uh, many times of trying to have that conversation, um, it just, you know, it just got to the point where it was like, well, you know, maybe I should take my talent um, elsewhere. And so yeah. I ended up leaving, I uh, placed my resume and um, uh, moved back to Canalay because uh, I had had a conversation with Karina prior and she was actually looking to open up Canalay for lunch service. And so it just, it kind of fit, it was good timing. And so I ended up moving back to Canalay under the pretense that my former partner and I would be running her lunch program as well as brunch on the weekends. So that's what started wild at Canalay, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. You started getting press about that, of course. It was great. It was a, a great move for us at the time. We just really tried to continue that kind of experimental uh, style that we were doing while at Squirrel. We were experimenting a lot more because we basically had carte blanche of the menu. We had specials every week and carried those specials over into brunch sometimes if we didn't sell out during the week. It was where I taught myself how to make pandasal. My Lola, who was 
recovering from cancer at the time. Whenever I would go visit, I would ask her what she wanted. And so she would always say, oh, get me chicken livers from Seafood City and, you know, some dinapai, some bread. And so I'd always pick up some pandasal. And, you know, there were some good pandasals, but there were some others that were, you know, maybe a little dry, maybe a little old. And so, you know, I, I, I told myself, it's like, I should make her some pandasal because, you know, it's Lola. Lola deserves the best, you know? Yeah. Mm hmm. And um, so I know, like, obviously, um, baking was is a whole different beast, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, how, how was that process? Um, it, I mean, it, it wasn't as, you know, it's a different set of skills just because, you know, with cooking, it's like jazz, right? It's like very, mm -hmm. like, uh, um, like free form, you know, you can add a little bit of this, a little pinch of that. Um, but with baking, it's very strict and, you know, you kind of have to follow the whole things. Like you, you can't just do like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, cause especially when you're dealing with yeast and, and like butter and fat content and like bread or something like that, it's, it's just very, uh, it's, it's very specific. And if you don't do, uh, if you don't do like the, uh, the steps, um, exactly the same, you know, you get something that's not what you want at all so uh baking is very finicky i think you mentioned someone but if you want to talk about some of these dishes you created so people can kind of be jealous again ah uh, yes okay so there's one photo that kind of looked bibimbap ish not that photo specifically but i did do a special once where we took that korean stone bowl where mm. we put the rice in like screaming hot so it would get like that nice crispy bottom and then i um I think I roasted some fish. I think it was like snapper. And then, you know, it came with um, bok choy and tomatoes and all that good stuff. And then, so, you know, we would have the bowl of rice and the fish, the cooked fish and uh, the fresh veggies. And then table side, they would drop the bowl down and they would have like a container of sinigang uh, broth that they would pour in. And so, you know, when it hit the screaming hot stone bowl, it would sizzle and Whoa. it would just like shoot up this like, uh, you know, the, the sinigang uh, aroma. And, you know, you just kind of get that like that sour heavy note right up front. Um, so it was, you know, it was kind of like, you know, fajitas at a Mexican joint, you know, yep. you're always like turning your head like, oh my God, what is that? What are they, yep. what did they order? It was, it was, it was that kind of appeal. Um, and it was awesome. So, you know, we had sinigang on the menu, had, uh, kinilao. I think I did kinilao with sea urchin. Um, and, oh man, I think, you know, we would do like, um, longanisa breakfast or longanisa sliders for breakfast at brunch sometimes with a with like a, an egg and you know people got to pop the yolk and make their own videos and stuff like that that's awesome mm -hmm. that's great cool so then um uh so while um at Ken Kenale, uh you were you were there from 20, 20 uh, 2014 to 2015 after that you decided to leave so sadly, Canale was coming up towards the end of their 10-year lease at the space. Yeah. For its time, a 10-year run for a restaurant in LA is unheard of. It was a solid spot, but it was also at the time where rates were increasing and all these new spots and shops started popping up. So naturally, Glendale Boulevard rent went up and she just couldn't keep up. So, you know, she yeah. decided to, you know, leave when she was up, you know, and, 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 mm -hmm. you know, and, and yeah. then, you know, RIP Canale. So yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, so then from that, from that point, I, I think you weren't finding the right thing. You were kind of being shoe chef at a couple of places, Plan to see America, mm -hmm. new house, and then you become chef over at go get him tiger. You just were all over the place, which is incredible. <laughs> Their first project was G and B coffee, which also had its start at squirrel. And so, a couple years later, Kyle, who is one of the owners of Go Get em, was looking to open a Los Feliz location. And so he uh, recruited me to pretty much create the menu and open up the Los Feliz location out there. It was the time of the grain bowl craze. So mm -hmm. I did an adobo grain bowl, a breakfast grain bowl 
we took rice and then a soft egg and kind of made this adobo sauce of sorts. So like this concentrate that we would mix with the rice. And I really wanted to play with dilis at the time, those like little tiny dried anchovies. I love furikake, uh, that, that Japanese, uh, that condiment that you, you know, is usually on top of rice. And yeah. so I thought, well, why don't we make our own, you know, like we can make, we can make some with dilis. We know how to make kale chips. And so, um, yeah. And so the idea for that was to kind of dress the rice with these adobo flavors and have these like fresh, crunchy cucumbers. And, you know, we made like a little indent in the middle of the bowl where we cracked the egg and then covered it with the furry cocky. So it was kind of like a nice surprise when she kind of like dug in there. It always sounds like a lot of the dishes, it's always about combining textures, crunch with softness and mm -hmm. juiciness. And it just sounds amazing. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, what were some other menu items? I believe I see some here that you had a mung bean pancake, you had a pandisal breakfast sandwich, mm -hmm. like you mentioned the adobo grain bowl. Oh man, we did so many things there. We did a couple different salads. You know, we had our own version of avocado toast. Everybody loves avocado yeah. toast. In LA. LA loves their own oh, avocado toast. <laughs> you know, this was like a different concept, so we didn't really get to do too many specials or anything. I think it was more of like a switching with the seasons. The mung bean pancake was something my sous chef there really put in the time and worked on. I helped him by tasting, but it was really just all him. He was a Filipino chef too. His name is Justin Dawes. He's in PDX now. But he did his due diligence and that mung bean pancake was incredible. And it was really good. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. you eventually hop as chef at mm -hmm. Forage. So I signed on to Forage because one of my best friends, Mel, was the chef there. And she wanted to introduce more of like a brunchy vibe for Forage for the weekends. Uh, forage in itself, it was kind of like a gorilla lemonade of sorts. It kind of had lemonade vibes. And she wanted to bring more of a traditional brunch concept to it. And so, you know, Mel Canlis, she... She brought me on, you know, we were, we had worked actually previously at Canalay. And so I helped her launch the brunch program. We had some really exciting things. We had a fried chicken sandwich. We had, that porridge was really awesome. We had pickles and crunchy, salty things. So it was like the textures was just out of control. It also had like a sous vide soft egg, like buried inside of it. So as you're kind oh. of working your way through, you get the egginess like mixed in. That's amazing. Getting hungry again, guys. I hope all of you are getting hungry too. So, okay. So Forage, you know, obviously you came up with cool dishes. You were only there for, I, I believe, like a little less than a year, Five right? months, yeah. yeah. Then after that, you went to Paramount Coffee Project. For Paramount, it was one of those like grapevine things where like they're looking for a chef and a friend of his was actually, she was going to do the wine pairings for Paramount's downtown location at the Row, which was this like really just beautiful space. And it was their first foray into a dinner service um, in addition to like daytime coffee shop vibes. And so they wanted someone to kind of not only open up downtown, but kind of get their dinner menu going. And they recommended me and then, you know, went through the whole interview process. But we started off with doing just a daytime uh, cafe and obviously another version of avocado toast there. <laughs> They're Sydney based. So I eventually got to mix Filipino with LA Cafe with Australian. And one of the things that we ended up putting on the menu was this lumpia sausage roll. Because when they were first telling me about pies and sausage rolls and things like that, I was like, oh, it's sausage in there. I wonder if lumpia would taste good. So it turned out to be really incredible because the pastry around the lumpia it was like a puff pastry. So you kind of had that really nice, crisp, buttery texture with the lumpia filling. And I think we had um, like some pickled carrots to serve alongside. And, you know, of course, like the sweet chili sauce um, for the for the dip. Um, and that was, you know, that was pretty incredible. We made our own ham. We wanted like a straightforward ham and eggs, but the way I do things, it's not really straightforward. <laughs> so we took this really great 
pork shoulder that we were sourcing from Peds and Barnett. Um, and I met Oliver at the farmer's market. And he just, he just, he and his family, they raised the most amazing pork. And for me is like the best pork to get in LA. And so we were making our own ham, we were brining it and roasting it. And we were serving it with eggs and fermented hot sauce that we were making ourselves there. And that was great. That was a squash pancake with eggs and some pickles and some tomatoes and stuff in that photo. I think we called it the LA baby because it was based off of the Dutch baby, which is kind of like a souffle pancake. Mm-hmm. And so we would switch up the the sweet fruit toppings, you know, as the seasons change. And this one, I think we did peaches with some whipped creme fraiche. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that lumpia sausage roll was, was something pretty special. Oh man, so hungry. <laughs> Before we hop to your current endeavor, um, so there was a time you encountered a bunch of different Filipino, Filipina chefs in the LA area, Barcada LA, I think, right? Barcada LA. Yeah. So I think it was 2015 or 2016 was the year. So at the time, my brothers at Lhasa were starting to do their own thing with their pop-ups. And I think I got, I don't remember if it was an email or like a DM from Alvin, but Basically, I got invited to dinner, like a potluck style dinner, and we're a bunch of Filipino chefs and cooks in the LA area, and we're making other people's food, so we can at least form our own community and get to know each other and have our own support system of sorts. And so we pretty much all met at that first potluck night and then it turned into a potluck once a month or every so often. There was always Jameson and there was always so much food. Maynard, who runs Quia Lord, he would always keep the Jameson going, but I think everybody was pretty sauced at the end of every gathering. And it was great because what started as kind of like a let's get to know each other turned into a support system, everything from I don't know what I'm doing wrong with my restaurant to, hey, do you have a good plumber that's not going to pull one over me to, oh, so my mom made Sinigang using this. What did your mom use? Which is kind of like a nice soundboard. Yeah, Yeah. open turntables for chefs, pretty much. It was nice to have that community you know and we still keep in touch i mean i think we're all pretty pretty busy right now like running our own places but you know and, every and, now and, then. and here's the thing for people who don't know who don't live here in la and who haven't seen the restaurants here so these people are basically the who's who of like some of the top i guess uh maybe filipino fusion type restaurants you have yeah. lasa you have egg slut people know egg slut you have Momser, rest mm-hmm. in peace, unfortunately. You have Kuya Lord. This is almost like the Rat Pack, you know, like <laughs> meeting up, like the current Filipino Rat Pack, like meeting up and just like talking and chatting. Yeah. So I guess you could say that like a lot of us were unestablished at the time, for the most part, with the exception of Alvin, who came up with x fame, all of us were still cooking for others. Mm -hmm. And Alasa was starting to do their own thing, but like didn't have their brick and mortar yet. And, you know, uh, 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 Quia Lord, he was working at Bestia. Um, Mm -hmm. I think uh, Charles was still at Tirania, I believe. Like this was this was before Rice Bar um, and before, you know, obviously before Mamser. Um, And yeah, I mean. It yeah. seems like a lifetime ago. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. But, you know, like yeah. like I've mentioned, all of you have, are doing to bigger, better things. And, and definitely, I think probably, like you mentioned, you having that familial aspect, right? Kind of like mm-hmm. very Filipino, right? Like, oh, let's yes. let's be all there to support each other, mm-hmm. kind of help push each other. And, and like you said, like helped each other workshop, you know, certain, yeah. you know, whatever it be, whether it be running a business or, or working recipes or just whatnot you know so it's amazing yeah. um and i believe you know obviously too like with alvin with uh unit 120 help you was an incubator for a lot of a lot of you know those chefs who have stuff spots now and i believe i think you had a couple of things too like you did some collaborations like filipino food fridays and uh one yeah. wild night in chinatown right yeah so one wild night was while i was still doing wild at Canale, 
Elvin invited us to do just a one-off event. As, as I think he was trying to feature different Filipino chefs just to try to like help promote and and help mm -hmm. get the word out, which I'm very thankful for. And it was really great. And it was a way for us to kind of flex a little bit and say like, yeah. look what we can do. Not just local chefs like, like myself, but you know, he brought down Carlo from Portland. Oh, he's amazing. I, I wish, I wish I could eat his food. I think he has Magna up in Portland, but you know, just trying to gather us all together in a way. You need that too, right? Especially in this yeah. industry, like here, the lifespan of bars, restaurants is very short and short lived mm -hmm. a lot of times. I'm sure it's like, feel like a constant swim where you're just trying to like reach yeah. for the top. Just trying to stay relevant is really difficult. Yeah. So here's some of the yeah. stuff you guys were messing around with. It looked yeah, amazing. So, <laughs> Incredible. Mm -hmm. And then Filipino Food Fridays was a menu where it's like a bunch of different chefs. So that was with LA Food Bowl, which is in conjunction with the LA Times. And at the time I was at Go Get em and uh, he asked me if I wanted to do a course for this menu. And I have this obsession with sea urchin, with uni. And also, I just really love Valenciana in general. And Arancini is like day-old risotto. You can fill it with cheese and then you bread it and then you fry it. But I wanted to do that to Valenciana. So I made the Valenciana rice with the turmeric and the aromatics and then formed them into patties. And then I did like a tempura batter and then fried them. So you kind of have this crispy, crunchy exterior with this really creamy like risotto interior with the rice. And then on top was sea urchin. And then it had a bunch of fresh vegetables outside. We had charred sugar snap peas and also some pickled ogo seaweed. And then just some really fresh herbs to balance the fried aspect of the dish, but it is essentially urchin balenciana you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So that's everybody helping me. That's Alvin and then um, Ken, who I think at the time when we first met was um, was cooking for Wolfgang Puck, but um, ended up opening uh, the most amazing bookstore with his wife, Michelle. It's called Now Serving in yep. Chinatown in the same plaza as Lhasa. I guess Lasita okay. now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Yeah, really cool stuff. So we, we will get into Petite Pestle, but uh, obviously, yeah. like, I think in the middle of your lunch, there was some stuff that kind of came out. It was referred to as Moldgate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for what I remember reading, there's a disgruntled chef talking about bad working conditions, being treated badly, and then eventually you got involved. I think at that point, I had only told... Um, you know, close friends about, you know, about the reasons why I left. I mean, I, I'm very thankful and still I'm very thankful of the opportunities that I had there. You know, I left for personal reasons and, you know, I always hoped that even though, you know, I personally felt burned by the, the taking of the credit that, you know, I always hope that like the next person that, that she would have learned from, um, from our situation. And that, you know, my, my hope was always that she would treat the next chef and the next set of people better. And I just kind of left it at that and went and found my own path. The only reason why that popped up was her staff was feeling unsupported and it was at the start of the pandemic and restaurants were starting GoFundMes and things like that just to help offset, you know, with staff and her current staff at the time felt unsupported and they were trying to see if she could do the same thing. And I don't have people that I know that are still there, but from what I understood, she didn't want to set up a GoFundMe for whatever reasons. And so it left a lot of people feeling really desperate and, um, you know, unsure of what to do next. And so her group of employees started talking to the writer of the story that would eventually come out. And they were building this whole case about the employees not feeling supported. And then they started talking to myself and other former employees. I jumped in because it made me sad that there was no growth for her and I felt sad for her current staff and my whole role in this whole thing was it's been happening. And so I felt that if I could help the employees gain traction and just shining light on what their grievances were, I felt that it was the right thing to do. 
And so I said my piece and I directed, you know, like this is their story. But of course, because I had gained my own attention over the years since leaving Squirrel, it kind of turned into its own story regarding not only with the moldy jam thing, it spun out into a couple different stories, which I was hoping was not going to be the case. People started coming forward and saying that she was doing it with Rhea and she continued to do it over the years and people not getting credit. And there were a lot of people, even in my own industry, that, you know, were saying things like, well, you know, you go to work for a person, you know, your work is is becomes part of um, the restaurant or the group or whatever, which... I, you know, I already had an understanding um, uh, with, but I guess the biggest difference is that with her, she doesn't really have a lot of experience. Like I said, in the kitchen during my time there, it was myself and my sous chef and, and the cooks creating these new things, often just us, while she was taking credit for things. So it continued after I left, not just with the savory chefs, but also with the pastry chefs. She was getting credit for things that the pastry chef was doing, even though she didn't necessarily have that experience to draw upon herself. That was the big, like, hoopla. After the article came out, was there any fallout? Um... I mean, you know, obviously we had we had people who didn't agree with my point of view and I I guess I had to ready m- myself for that just, you know, uh we had opened, you know, Petite Peso already um when that whole thing came out and so, you know, people were commenting on the the, the Eater article like, "Oh, she should have named it Petty Peso." And it's just like I don't care. Oh, I mean, wow. you didn't live through it, you know, like you don't you know, you didn't experience it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing like feeling proud to put something on a menu that, you know, uh, uh, under, under a chef who you've learned from, who you've, uh, who continues to show you things like, you know, like a chef like Daniel Balud or, you know, any of, of the other chefs that I had worked underneath previously, and then mm-hmm. it's a whole nother thing where you're coming up with the things and someone else is in, in like, you know, the owner is getting credit for it, even though they've, you know, they've never done it before. They wouldn't even know where to start to do it. Um, so, you know, there's a difference. Um, you know, I'm proud of the things that I made, the things that I put on the, the menu over there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, I don't know, I just... Like I said before, it wasn't fair for her to take credit for it. And and at that point, uh, summer of 2020, like enough, you know, plenty of people had had enough at that time. And, you know, it was something that, you know, couldn't be kept quiet anymore. Well, yeah, that's crazy because, I mean, I remember hearing about it. I feel like it happened earlier, but I guess, man, so much has happened in 2020. But uh, that so that happened in the middle. So now let's talk about your current project, mm-hmm. Petit Peso. How long was that in the making? How did you link up with your co-partners? My current partners now, Robert and me, approached. It's kind of funny that the way we met is so very 2020s in the sense that I got this DM on Instagram one day and it was Tiffany and she asked to sit down and, and just talk. They had this concept for a Filipino restaurant and wanted to see where I was at. And it was funny because I, I Instagram DMs, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it felt a little strange. And so luckily we had a mutual friend um, in common, my, my buddy Koichi. And so I called him. I was like, hey, who is this person? Have you worked with them? Like, can you vouch? And he was like, yeah, she's dope. She's worked with Mina Group. And you know, yeah, you should, you know, at least hear her out. So, so we met uh, one evening and we talked about it. They told me about what they had in mind and I was excited about it, but I was actually at Paramount Coffee Project at the time and I didn't feel ready to leave, but you just got to keep options open. And so we just kept in touch over the years. And when the time and the space came up, you know, it was just like, well, should we do this? And it was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. So I left Paramount Coffee Project and we found the old rice bar spot downtown. Actually, it was Baon. So Charles left 
rice bar to pursue Mamser. And then A.C. Brawl took over. I think he was working with Charles also at Rice Bar. So A.C. took over and it was bought on for a few months. And A.C. eventually left to focus on Bebot. And so the spot opened up again. And we actually had another spot in mind, but in the arts district, but it fell through. And so when 419 West 7th Street popped up, It was like, well, hey, why don't we continue, you know, the Filipino restaurant vibes in that space? Like, it, you know, it seems like a good idea. Third gen Filipino spot in the in the space. And so, you know, we uh, we got a hold of the landlords and had a talk. And next thing you know, we signed the lease in December. And then we had originally set out to open in February, but that was when COVID happened. And so we pushed the open and what was supposed to be a breakfast lunch spot turned into lunch dinner out of necessity. So, you know, no one really orders breakfast for delivery, right? So yeah. With the other restaurants, you weren't involved with the build-out process, but how did you guys come up with the look and the name for Petit Peso? So Robert and Tiffany, they had the name lined up um, already uh, prior okay. to uh, my joining on. So, and, and it's actually the name that helped kind of like seal the deal for me. It was already a pretty sweet deal um, up front, but when they told me the name, the origins of the name, um, I was like, yes, let's do it. Let's let's do it. Um, so they chose Peso. So when Peso, actually Peso was supposed to be a dinner restaurant um, in the very beginning in the arts district, but, uh, you know, it fell through. And so we ended up, uh, when we got the space, since, since it was much smaller, we turned it into Petit Peso instead. But they thought the Peso up until today is still undervalued currency-wise from mm-hmm. the Philippines you know, US. And so much like the food, it's gone under the radar, you know, people that have tried, you know, LA Rose Cafe has been here forever. And, you know, no one ever really talks about, you know, that Filipino restaurant. And so, you know, the currency and the food has gone uh, undervalued all this time and still definitely is. And so the reason for calling it peso was we wanted to show how much value it can have. And, you know, kind of raising the bar for our food and, uh, you know, like really trying to push it forward um, uh, and showing the value that it is worth and, you know, how much more it can be. And so when they told me that, you know, it was like, yes, I would love to be a part of that. Sold. (laughs) Yeah. Something else I read. Originally, you guys were going to hire a pastry chef, but to keep overhead low, you had to start baking yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So... We all liked that whole like French brasserie vibe, um, mm. kind of like like neighborhood staple kind of kind of vibe. And so we thought, well, why don't we take that approach? But, you know, we come at it with Filipino food um, and, you know, and, and we thought, you know, also with the we wanted to do like an, a, an even more extensive pastry case, kind of like what you would see at like a French brasserie, except it would be you know, all the Filipino classics, like, uh, you know, pandasal, ensamada, um, all those things, you know, we had very uh, ambitious plans. But like you said, obviously, with the pandemic, we had to pull back and say, maybe this is something we can do ourselves and jump back into the whole baking game and trying to learn how to make all these things. So there's a lot of trial and error, especially with the ensamada, because I grew up eating the Goldilocks brand and it's really soft. And so, oh man, just trying to figure out how to get it close to that same soft texture was really difficult. How's it running a restaurant during a pandemic? Uh, You know, it it ebbs and it flows. Uh, Lately, it's actually been better because, you know, with with vaccines and, and, uh, you know, every, Mm -hmm. like more and more people getting vaccinated every day, there is a, I don't know. And uh, there's just kind of like this sense of ease that we have Mm -hmm. been feeling lately, uh, with people. So, you know, I think people are coming out more. I'm not sure if some office folks are coming back to work. Because at least in the last two weeks alone, there's been an uptick in new diners. One woman said she lived a block away and she never knew that we were there, but she never really like walked around because she was afraid of COVID. And 
you know, other people who, um, you know, were checking in on where they worked. And so, you know, just happened to walk around and find us. So, and, and tried us out. So, um, you know, obviously in the beginning it was hard just because we were relying, you know, where, where our spot is located on seventh street there usually pre pandemic was a lot of foot traffic and just a lot of people going to and from work on foot. And so once that hit and everyone started working from home, we lost all that foot traffic. It was virtually non-existent. So we jumped on all of the food apps except for caviar at first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were getting a lot of our uh, orders in that way. Um, but then, you know, all those apps add up and it wasn't just yeah. us that was getting buried in fees. It was everybody that had to mm -hmm. jump on apps. Luckily, the city of LA put a 15% cap on the fees that the apps were charging. But if you're running on more than a couple, it's still a lot to pay out, you know, at the end of the month. So, yeah. you know, it, it it's it was very it was very hard for a lot of restaurants not just us but, you know we um we ended up getting a lot of support after that squirrel fallout story mm -hmm. which was great but you know as as the winter came and cases spiked and i think a lot of people were uh growing very concerned about um and also like all those new variants that came out with covid you know it yeah. it scared people so over the winter was pretty difficult we closed for a couple months and we actually reopened earlier this month so far it's been pretty good people are kind of refinding us again mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we actually had to shrink down to just using one app um, mm -hmm. for the for petite peso so now we're just solely on chow now and wow. really encouraging people to call in place orders for pickup that way I asked you already about the previous restaurants, but what are you serving up here at Petit Peso right now? So right now we have our menu staples, such as our chicken adobo. We have Strauss beef kare kare. We also have baboy tim, which is a play on pata tim. We use pork belly instead. We're also very veg forward and we're very aware of diners, Filipinos and non-Filipinos alike, who are... Uh, more conscious about, you know, consuming more vegetables. So we have some veggie and vegan options. We have our awesome pork lumpia, but we also have a vegan version where we use Impossible instead. And you can't really tell a difference. It's all so good still. We have those classics, but we also do like fun modern spins on it. Like for our chicken adobo, when we prepare the chicken, we take the skins off, but we roast it separately. So it's like chicken skin chicharron that mm. we crumble on top. So you got the rice, you got the braising liquid, you get the chicken leg on top, but then you also have crunchy chicken skin and garlic chips and scallions. So, you know, you have that comfort in a bowl, but you also have that nice crunchy texture that kind of like, you know, kind of like perks you up like, oh my God, this is, this is adobo, but it's different. And the yeah. same thing with the kare kare, we have um, kind of like a like a salsa matcha of sorts. It's kind of uh, so it's got we got the peanuts and the sesame seeds and you know the dried chilies that we kind of cook low and slow in um, in oil. So it's kind of like you kind of have this like crunchy pop on top of the kare kare, which is usually you know one note. Um, I mean, like I love you know like my my parents kare kare will always you know place in my heart, but you know I. I think with Filipino food, um, to kind of get it to pop out a little bit, um, you know, we have to move forward. We can have those traditional flavors, but we can also have fun and experiment and make it interesting, whether it be um, introducing new textures or um, you know flavors that you know might not you might not have thought of originally. Last summer we did Halo Halo. So we did the shave ice and then we also made passion fruit jelly, a pink guava syrup. And then we also had the, the sweet jackfruit and coconut and a little bit of oat milk. And it's interesting because, you know, it's not traditional Halo Halo, but, you know, we kind of wanted to make something bright and tropical and fresh. Um, and it also was vegan. And so, you know, a lot of people had it and were like, are you sure this is vegan? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the biggest compliment for me, like when, when yeah. it comes to like making vegan food. Of course. Yeah, definitely when they don't notice. 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I guess you, you kind of touched upon this, but if you want to add a little more to this, uh, DJ Neo6 asks, uh, what do you think it would take Filipino food to be as ubiquitous, ubiquitous as other Asian foods? I mean, that's a very good question. You know, I, I, that's kind of a loaded question because it's, it's, it's a couple different parts. There's, there's supporting, um, there's supporting places like us, you know, whether it's us or Lasita or Cuyo Lord or, you know, uh, whatever iteration Charles has up next. Um, it's supporting those places that continue to push our food forward, um, you know, and to like, to really, you know, we all know crab mentality, it's, it's pervasive and it exists in our culture. And so, you know, like, you know, there, there, there was a situation or there was an, um, an incident when I was at Go Get em where, you know, we had the pandesal sliders and a couple of titas that worked at the Kaiser just on the other block, you know, came and, you know, they ordered it and they told uh, my coworker who was at, um, who was on the, the register, they're like, is this pandesal? And, and, you know, he said like, yes, that's how our chef makes it. And they're like, well, this isn't pandesal, you know? And, you know, you got to love the titas, you know, they're a hard <laughs> critic, to, you know, all the time. but, you know, uh, that same mentality, it's like, it doesn't push us forward. Like it doesn't, it doesn't help us. It only pulls us back. And, you know, um, John Eric Concordia, who uh, is the chef owner of Park's Finest, he put up a really awesome post the other, uh, the other week on Instagram. Uh, I hope I don't mess this up, but basically says, don't be the Filipino who tells your non-Filipino friends that the Filipino food that the Filipino makes isn't Filipino. It's a lot, but you know, but it, it spoke to me and you know, it resonated. And it's really like, if we are not gonna have that support, we're not gonna be able to continue. We're gonna be, you know, we're gonna close down and, and end up working for other people. So for mm -hmm. Filipino food to be as ubiquitous as other Asian foods, we need that support. And, you know, sure, my, you know, my uh, adobo is obviously not going to taste like your Lola's or your Nana's, but, you know, it's not, it's not, I'm not trying to cook like them. Like it's, it's, you know, we're all trying to cook something similar. And a lot of us, you know, whether or not we were born in the U.S. or in the, in the Philippines, like, We've, we have all this influence from places that we've worked at. And, um, you know, we're just trying to just mash it all together because it's, it's you know, for us, it's, it's a way to bridge the gap. It's a way to bridge the Philippines um, and the U.S. And so, you know, there's, even if you don't like it, you know, it's like, it's, just might not be for you. It just might not be, you know, the flavor that you're looking for. And that's fine because, you know, I personally know that I can't please everybody and that's fine because, you know, we all have our, our opinions and our tastes and all that stuff. And, you know, if you don't like our food, then, you know, maybe check out Queen Lord or maybe check out Lisa. That mm -hmm. might be more up your alley, but to, you know, I think, I think, you know, we definitely shouldn't dismiss, you know, everyone, every Filipino chef that tries to put something new, put something fresh out there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Neil says 100 for sure. Yeah. Definitely. That crab mentality is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so now, so I, I know we talked to asked your, you know, I asked you about what your parents thought that first at Kennelay. <laughs> so now obviously they've tried Petit Peso, correct? They, okay. they tried it in the, um, in the R and D process, because they okay. actually they left for the Philippines last February, oh, so okay. they were not able to uh, to to come by for like the opening and all that stuff. But you know, once it's safe to travel again, you know they're they're going to come back to LA and yeah. you know get to try it. Awesome, that's great. Um, and so yeah, so you know, I think we didn't really touch upon that, or we kind of did, but this R and D process, like, are you doing this at home or are you doing this? Like, I guess in the late hours after the restaurant closes, um, and how long does this take? And are you just like, Oh, let me just, I don't know. Like, how does it come out of your head? And obviously it's collaboration, like you said, with your sous chefs and all that stuff. Like how does yeah. it tell, tell us about the process? So it's a little bit of everything that you described. So, you know, sometimes it's an idea. Sometimes it's like, oh, I really love Valenciana, but it's like such a process to make and, you know, it doesn't travel well or, you know, whatever reasons mm. there is. Or, you know, it could be something that, 
you know, that I ate that I was influenced by. So, but in terms of petite peso specifically, you know, mm -hmm. we're keeping in line with Filipino food and, um, you know, we are, I don't know, just thinking of ways to put those, maybe not necessarily the actual dish, but like those Filipino flavors um, to like really get it out there and to, to, to have people start to recognize it. Um, and so, you know, trying to come up with a dish, you know, we keep a couple things in mind, um, how, you know, like in, in terms of workflow, like, is this easy to put together? How much prep does it involve? Um, and then once we kind of like get through that first set of questions, then it's, uh, and then it's like, okay, well, how do we do this? That you know, how do we put this together so that it becomes this unique uh, eating experience? And uh, you know, the, there's a lot of trial and error. Very rarely does it happen that you know we we do the first test and you know it, it's like you know it, it, it's a hit out of the park. But um, you know. Sometimes, sometimes it, it involves a lot of tweaking and, you know, at the end you're like, ugh, this is not going to work. Like we can put this on the shelf, you know, for another time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, sometimes I'll do it at home. Sometimes, you know, if we have some downtime at the restaurant, uh, I'll do it there, but, um, you know, it's, it's everywhere, you know. Yeah. I sometimes I'll start it at home, but you know I have to keep in mind that my oven at home is not the same as the kitchen oven. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that because uh, yeah, definitely I feel yeah like when you mentioned like the logistics part because if people don't know like Petit Peso is a pretty tiny restaurant. It's not like it's not like your other restaurants you were working at where it's like a huge kitchen and yeah. you had multiple burners. Um, so definitely like you have to utilize the space and yeah. uh very uh sparingly and i guess uh, yeah, yeah. We're just trying to find the most efficient way i mean also we don't have gas at petit peso it's all electric so oh no way partners yes so you know trying to create what we put out there uh without the use of gas and you know we're wow. running electric oven electric burners like induction burners and like electric fryers um and like an electric know that. top plancha. Dang. So, you know, it, it, it just goes to show you how with like a little bit of like ingenuity and, you know, you know, anything can happen. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's even more props to you for, for doing that there. Cause it's, that's, <laughs> I mean, our, even us, I mean, obviously we're simple cooks, but you know, we're like, when we go to a place where we're staying or whatever, a kitchenette, we're like, mm -hmm. oh, I hate electric stoves. You know, we're like, oh, no, we need our gas stoves. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, a whole other set of like figuring out, so. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so, uh, so Neil, actually, so I did try, I did try your adobo French dip. Mm -hmm. uh, well, amazing, but uh, so Neil, his question is, uh, do you have a French chef you have liked to learn from or collab with, if so, who? Mm -hmm. And, or I guess, are you done with French cuisine? And I was I, mentioning the French dip because of that reason, but go ahead. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that I'm necessarily, I, I am not done with French cuisine in the sense that I will still probably employ a lot of the uh, techniques, you know, into whatever we end up making at Petit Peso. Um, but in terms of, ooh, French chef, you would, have liked to learn from or collab with um let's see who are the french chefs here uh so you know right off the top of my head i think it'd be cool eventually to do a collab maybe with chef ludo <laughs> that oh <would> yeah <laughs> amazing yeah you were kind of aiming more towards like i guess a brunch like breakfast lunch vibes like mm -hmm. do you have some breakfast menu items ready to roll right once uh I yeah. guess maybe switch your hours to the regular hours, what you originally intended. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll see when we get to that point, but. Cross um, fingers, right? Yeah. Cross our fingers. Um, but, you know, a couple of things that we wanted to put on the menu uh, originally for breakfast, like we had plans to put in, um, yeah, like a, like a breakfast sandwich with, either with uh, tocino or longanisa and an egg and, you know, with our pandesal 
that we make in-house, we also wanted to do um, like an arroz caldo for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Tahoe also, I love Tahoe, mm -hmm. eating Tahoe when I was little. And we use the really awesome Meiji brand of silken tofu, which is the mm -hmm. closest thing you can get to actually, you know, um, from like the guy on the street that's like screaming Taho in the morning. Um, yeah. Uh, and the, that that soy flavor is the closest that, that we have found. Um, and then, you know, we make our own brown sugar syrup. We make our own boba with it. And we also incorporate some flax seeds and then cacao nibs on top for like a nice little crunchy topping. Oh, it's always about that crunch. Always yeah. about that crunch. That texture. Yes, I, love, I, I love that crunch. Yeah, the texture of anything. Because, yeah. yeah, definitely that's that's what calls out to you is like, oh, my God, this is juicy and then oh my god that crunch what is that mm -hmm. so where do you see yourself and your restaurant or is it multiple restaurants five to ten years from now oh man um you know considering petite peso was not in the initial plans mm -hmm. um i think it would be cool if we had you know over the next couple of years had a couple petite pesos, you know, mm -hmm. that like fast casual concept. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, long term, I think it would be nice to eventually get back and uh, get back to and revisit the dinner concept and yeah. really fulfill that uh, Filipino restaurant with the French brasserie vibes, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and really, really bringing that to fruition. Uh, you know, it, 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 it hasn't left any of our minds. And if anything, you know, the pandemic did what it did. But if anything, it, it kind of helped, uh, kind of really helped us, like, figure out how we want to take the next step. So, you know, uh -huh. stay tuned for that. Yeah, no, that sounds great. <laughs> this is, sorry, I was giggling because I saw this question. Insider question. How prevalent is Insapot in restaurants? And have you experimented with it? Uh, I have not seen an Instapot in a restaurant yet. Um, <laughs> I've experimented with it at home. Uh, we have an Instapot here. And um, I think I uh, we did some um, braised oxtail in it once. Uh, we didn't make we didn't make the OG kare kare, but that's something that, you know, you know, instead of waiting three hours, you can have kare kare in one. So yeah, win win. Oh, wow. Um, um, so what would you uh, tell your younger self? Ooh, oh, man. Um, and or what would you do differently? <clears throat> what would I do? Um, you know, I, you, you always think that you would try to do something different when you were younger, but really, everything that you've had, everything that you've encountered leads you to where you currently are. So, you know, if I, I, I don't know that I would necessarily change something. I mean, if, if anything, I would maybe tell, tell my younger self to be a little bit more assertive. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, in terms of like my personal and professional growth, I, you know, I, I, I was, I was a shy kid. I, I attribute it to the culture shock from moving here as a, as a young kid, you know, but yeah. you know, I, I, I think if I could tell my younger self something, it's, it's to just be more, not aggressive, but like be more assertive and, you yeah. know, like don't be afraid to like really go after the things that you want. Um, I'm, I'm happy with the way, you know, my, my path has, has turned out. So, so happy for you and definitely rooting for you. And, uh, We'll, I'll support and everyone support Petit Peso, support all local restaurants, especially yep. the Filipino Please. restaurants. Thank you again. Yeah. Everyone, like I mentioned, give her a follow on her Instagram as well as Petit Peso's Instagram. Their website's right there as well as her website. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing and being honest and candid with everything. You know, um, <laughs> Anything you want to say to the audience? Um, just come check us out. We'll be there. Um, support your local restaurants. Support your local Filipino restaurants if you got them nearby. Um, you know, uh, support means all the world right now, especially trying to navigate through these, not even post, we're not even post pandemic. So, you know, we're still figuring out the next step. So, you know, and, um, you know, be kind, you know, be cool. <laughs> That's yeah. all we ask for. Come check us out and be cool. Yeah. <laughs>